Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the Bible that brings us the truth of God and that it's so clear, especially because of prophecy, and that it's relevant to our times and to the needs that we have in our day and in our age. We ask your blessing as we study today and as we look at some current developments in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to begin by sharing with you a quote from um, a Japanese man who is a secular person. He writes fiction and nonfiction. His name is Haruki Murakami. He made a very insightful statement. You know, sometimes people that are children of the world are wiser than the children of light. And I've noticed that sometimes there are remarks or comments that are made in the in the you know in the press or in other places that are very insightful this is from haruki murakami he said everyone deep in their hearts is waiting for the end of the world to come in other words he's saying that doesn't matter whether you're secular or religious or no matter what your persuasion is politically or any other way you're still in your heart. Everyone in the world is looking for the end of the world to come. I think that's very significant. Here is a man who would have no knowledge of the Bible necessarily or anything spiritual, but yet God has put in his heart the idea that the end of the world is coming, and he's noticed this same thing in other people. They, they don't have the right solutions. They don't know how to navigate the end of the world, but they nevertheless are thinking, what's going to happen when the end of the world comes? I thought it was extremely interesting because we're living at the end of time. And as we come down to the end of time, there is a collusion of prophetic developments taking place in the world around us. In other words, there are a number of streams of prophetic developments. And these streams of prophetic development have been all maturing at the same time, or more or less the same time. Over the last 10, 15, 20 years, they have all reached a level of, of not only maturity, which is of course true, but also the, the collaboration or the, the influence of each of them on the others brings us to a point in time of final climactic moments. For instance, globalization has been going on for a long time. The elites have been working on this behind the scenes for quite a few decades. And now that it has become mature, they no longer are trying to hide the fact that their agenda is globalization. In fact, if you're looking at the media, the media, the leftist media in particular, is constantly extolling the virtues of globalization and trying to get people to support it. They're very hostile to people like Donald Trump, for instance, who is a conservative. And he is one who is, in some ways, opposing certain things that the elites want to happen to accelerate globalization. I think it's interesting because uh, you know, Donald Trump does a lot. A lot of people ask me, How, what do you think about Donald Trump? <laughs> and I have to tell them, I, I'm, I'm watching very carefully the things that he does because people often underestimate Donald Trump. Don't you underestimate him. You see, Donald Trump does a lot of rhetoric, a lot of discussion, a lot of, a lot of uh, polemics. If you know what I mean, polemics are, 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 are adversarial uh, ways of, of, of relating to things. Anyway, he's very polemic and very, very um, uh, confrontational in some of the things he does. And people write him off because they see him as kind of crazy. But friends, something troubles me. And that is that somehow people misunderstand what is actually happening. They don't have a prophetic mindset, so they can't understand 
how to interpret the things that are happening in the world around them. And yes, they see the rhetoric and they sort of write him off as if he's a loony. But in reality, he's actually achieving some things that are very significant from a prophetic point of view. I'd like to also read to you a quotation which strikes me as very relevant to our, our times at the moment. It says here, <clears throat> this is from third volume of Selected Messages, page 339. Third volume of Selected Messages, page 339. It says, the Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. Now that com com um, coincides with the idea of the collusion of prophetic development. It's interesting that the Bible has put all of this together over centuries. Little bits and pieces of the scripture were put together. The books of Moses, then the books of the, of the, the kings, and then you have the books of the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets. Then you have the gospels and the writings of Paul and others. And each generation has its additional light that God has given to it. And all of this is bound up together, especially for this last generation. I think that's extremely important. Because the Bible is more relevant now than when, than it was written, than when it was written. And we need the Bible now more than we've ever needed it before. Because as these developments in prophecy mature, and as they, as they unite their specific influences to maximize their, their effect, the Bible is the only book that can give us accurate, clear, and irrefutable guidance on how to navigate those unique and difficult circumstances that we are all going to face. Some may say, well, this is rather uh, apocalyptic. <laughs> Perhaps it is. But the thing about it is, the Bible is apocalyptic. The Bible wants us to understand that we are living in the last days. So I mentioned globalization. That's only one aspect of this collusion between the prophetic developments of our time. Globalization is found in Revelation chapter 13. If you'll turn with me there, Revelation chapter 13. <coughs> I'd like to point out just a couple of things to sort of touch base. For some of you, this might be familiar. Uh, others, it might be new, a little bit strange. But when you think about it, the Bible actually gives us clear understanding of what to expect in these last days. I want you to notice it says in verse 8, Revelation 13, verse 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him. This is talking about global worship. Revelation 13 mentions worship five times. It puts us in context that the last days will be focused, or the key principle of the last days is worship. Who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship the God of heaven, or are you going to worship the God of this world? Which is it going to be? All that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him. This is talking about a global religion. This is not talking about some, some minor religious development. This is a major issue in the last days. And as we see this thing unfolding, it strikes me that religious freedom is under assault. I don't know if you've noticed it here in Denmark, but it is under assault everywhere. For instance, I wondered as I was growing up how we were ever going to get to the place where the United States could impose a worship law on all of its citizens, and for that matter, on people in the rest of the world. You see, the second beast of Revelation 13, which we find in verse 11, says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. 
What does this mean? All the power. What power is this? The first beast, of course, represents Rome. There's no other possible conclusion if you look at it carefully, because the only, the only um, entity, global entity, that has the ability to impose worship would be Rome. The descriptions that you read of the Vatican and the papacy and the Catholic Church in Revelation 13, 17, and 18 all make it very clear by description that Rome is the only possible entity on the planet. Yes, there's other ideas, there's, there's uh, other suggestions, but nothing really fits other than Roman, the Roman Catholic system. So the first beast is Rome. <coughs> But the second beast comes out of the earth in a remote area, and so therefore it cannot come out of Europe or Scandinavia. It has to come out of a new place. And so uh, a couple hundred years ago, the United States arose out of a remote area. And it exercises, the Bible says, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. This second beast is the land of freedom, the land of religious freedom. So I wondered how was it going to, you know, with such clear uh, and strong constitutional principles, such as the separation of church and state, such as the uh, no establishment of church or religion clause in the Constitution, such as the right of private assembly and, and other rights that, that were in, in, incorporated into the Constitution. How is it that this country is going to exercise all the power of the first beast, which is persecuting power? The power of the first beast was a power that influenced governments so much that they had power to influence those governments to impose worship laws to follow their principles of worship. That's what the Roman papacy did during the Middle Ages. Now, in our time, America has grown a bit weak. Under President Obama, for instance, a lot of the, the power and influence of the United States has been eroded. But did you notice the slogan that Donald Trump used in his campaign for the President of the United States? Make America great again. Friends, that fits the Bible. The Bible says that America is going to become so great that she exercises all the power of the first beast before her. In other words, she's going to be able to impose worship laws. She's going to be able to impose religious restrictions on those who do not go along with her intentions. In other words, I saw Donald Trump's campaign slogan as rather prophetic. Make America great again. He doesn't realize it. He has no idea that what he is doing is actually fulfilling Bible prophecy to a certain extent. He will perhaps not <coughs> fulfill it all. Depending on how long he is president, he'll get some of it done, maybe more of it done, but he's being opposed at every turn by the globalist elites. But really, ultimately, it's all for the same destination, all for the same purpose. Because, you know, these global elites... They bide their time. They wait. If someone comes along that doesn't match up with their specific agenda, they'll work with him on the areas that they can. You know, the Catholic Church is the same way. She works with the presidents and the pr prime ministers and the kings and rulers of the earth in harmony with her agendas and her goals in whatever extent and whatever um, context she can. Because she knows that people will sooner or later, 
get tired of their leaders. The elites know that sooner or later, people will get tired of their leaders and they'll vote in the other party or another party. That's the way they see it. And the next party will have perhaps the things they need to accomplish what their other goals are. So they work with one and certain things, and they work with another and other things, and they work with another and other things. Until, over time, the whole system of globalization matures and develops. That's how they do it. They're not concerned if somebody comes along and tears up a trade deal. Well, they're concerned, but they're not overly concerned. You see, they know that they can come back to that in a future president or a future prime minister or whatever. They're, they're just biding their time. So in other words, as we go along in history, the trajectory is still the same, no matter who is president, no matter who is the leader of a nation. The principles, the destination is still the same. And that's the interesting thing about prophecy. You can rely on it. The Bible can be relied on because the prophecies are accurate and they will come to pass. Um, I find it to be very interesting that at the very time when people are turning their backs on the Bible and they sneer at it and they scoff at it and they say, oh, that's rubbish, I don't need God, I don't need the Bible, I don't need anything. The Bible has become the most relevant book ever on the history of, in the history of this world. It has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. And those who pay attention to the Bible, those who study the scriptures, they will understand like nobody else. The wise, the Bible says, shall understand. Are you wise? Do you want to be wise? We find that in Daniel chapter 12. Just turn with me there for a minute. I'll show it to you. Daniel chapter 12. So it says here in verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. So in other words, if you are wise, the, the God of heaven will provide you with light and information. And notice it says brightness. I think this is very interesting. They will shine as the brightness of the firmament. Can you look at the sky and see the sun in your eyes with your naked eye? This is not a good idea, is it? It's too bright. But if you think about what God is trying to tell us in Isaiah chapter 60, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 60 for a second. This one says in verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. God is looking for people today on whom He can give His glory, His power, and His brightness. If you are wise and you follow the Bible and you live for Christ, you live in harmony with the Bible's principles, God will give you victory over the enemy. God will give you victory over every temptation. And when God gives you that level of victory, He can then trust you with power. And that's what this is talking about. Isaiah chapter 6, he's actually talking about the glory of the Lord, <clears throat> which is His power. But what is God's power? What is God's glory? That's His character, isn't it? You get that from Exodus chapter 33 and 34. Exodus chapter 33 and 34 is a story of when Moses asked to see God's glory. God said, you can't see my glory and live. But he says, what I'll do is, if you'll come up to the mountain, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by. And as I pass by, I'll pull back my hand and you can see my back parts. So Moses eagerly climbed the mountain, Mount Sinai. 
And while he was up there, God did what he said he would do. He put him in the cleft of the rock and covered him. And he passed by. And as he passed by, he declared the glory of the Lord, the name of the Lord, which is his glory. And it was all character qualities. Long-suffering, goodness, kindness, mercy, forgiving iniquity, and so on. All these things are characteristics of God. And God wants to put those characteristics in you. So when it says the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, it's talking about the character of God has risen upon you. You see that? The glory and character are the same. It says, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. How does God arise on you? It's by putting His character in you, see. And His glory shall be seen upon thee. So those people out there will see the glory of God in His people. And the contrast is getting so stark. Their lives are in chaos and confusion. They're in darkness. The Bible says gross darkness. Do we live in gross darkness today? Just walk around the streets of Copenhagen. You'll see it everywhere. We are living in gross darkness, and God wants to change the circumstances so that those people in gross darkness have one last opportunity to see the true character of God. You know, Satan has distorted God's character, and so people have turned their backs on God because of that distortion. They think that they don't want to serve a God who's tyrannical. Well, God isn't tyrannical. It's Satan that's tyrannical, but he blames it all on God. God has to allow him to manifest himself so that everyone can come up to the end of time and make a decision in their lives on the basis of information. God doesn't want people coming to the gates of heaven and saying, oh, you've got to let me in. I didn't have enough information. You see, God is working so that everyone can see the full light of his glory, his character in people who are focused on serving God. These people in darkness see those people, the Bible says, because the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon thee. The people in darkness shall, she, shall see the glory of the Lord, or the brightness, the, the radiance, the peace, the joy on your face. And they will, they will come to you and they will say, show me the way. My life is in chaos. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. Show me how to find the peace and the joy and the happiness that's on your face. Show me how to find the brightness that I see in you because I'm in darkness. Anyway, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing study because this chapter of Isaiah 60 gives us also um, some clarity concerning Islam. You may, Islam is, 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 is in prophecy, definitely. Um, Islam is represented here as the um, multitude of Midian and Ephah and Sheba. Um, you find that in verse 6 of Isaiah 60. Um, these individuals will come. They will bring gold and incense. They will come looking for truth because the Quran tells them to follow the people of the book. And sincere Muslims are open to this. They want to find out who they can trust with the truth, who they can trust that has the truth. Anyway, that's a whole other subject. We can talk about that at another time. But globalization has matured. It's not completely there yet, but it's really just waiting for certain things to come into place and the final building block of globalization will fit into place, especially the religious globalization, because ultimately that's where it ends. You know, it starts with, it starts with the secular, economic, political globalization but ultimately it ends up with religious globalization. That's just one of a number of tipping points. Then there's 
also the destruction of Western constitutions. I wondered how we were going to ever get to the place where the United States can impose a Sunday law. We'll come back to that now. I couldn't figure it out. But after 9-11, it, it all came clear. The penny dropped. Shortly thereafter, a few days thereafter, President Bush issued an executive order freezing the assets of the terrorists. And I thought to myself, that's significant. That means the terrorists cannot buy or sell. They are reduced to the barter system. And I remember Revelation 13. Back to Revelation 13 again. I think Revelation 13 is perhaps the most significant chapter in some ways as it relates to the end of time. Revelation chapter 13, verse 17 says that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. It's talking about verse 16, which it's a follow-on from verse 16. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This is talking about the worship laws that will come upon the earth. How does a nation, this second beast, cause all, small and great, rich and poor, all over the world, to receive a mark? that supports the worship laws that we read about in verse 15. You see, it starts all the way back in verse 11, but as you come along, you can see the progress. And in verse 15, it says that those who do not worship the, the image of the beast would be killed. So there'll be a death penalty for not going along with the worship laws that will come on the earth. And then, as a result, they will not be able to buy or sell. So there'll be economic restrictions, there'll be, um, there'll be prison sentences, there'll be death penalties, there'll be all sorts of these things that um, we will see against God's true people who love and obey Jesus and live by His commandments. So how is this going to happen? I couldn't figure it out. And at 9-11, I began to realize, and ever afterward, I saw all these different principles of the Inquisition being resurrected in our own time, in the West. Torture in secret prisons, indefinite detention, trial by tribunal rather than trial by jury, the list goes on and on. So I was interested in this, and now I'm still saying, how are we going to get to undermining religious freedom in the United States? And over the last four to eight, well, last, yeah, last five years or so, it has become clear. You can't start undermining religious liberty with a Sunday law. And some people are so fascinated with a Sunday law that they can't see other things going on in, uh, in current events that fulfill Bible prophecy. You know, when there's anything that has to do with Sunday legislation, they get all excited about that, which, and, and I think it's significant. But there's other things. You know, President Obama, for instance, one of his signature achievements was his health care law. And Donald Trump's trying to, you know, soften this whole thing down. Well, I don't know whether he's going to succeed at that or not. You know, there, there was supposed to be a vote on it on Thursday, actually, this last week. And, but the, the, the thing about it is, the revised bill, does, we don't really know that much about it. it. We don't know whether it actually improves things or whether it makes them worse. Often politicians say they're going to improve something and they make it worse. Have you noticed? That's the way they are. All in the name of approving something, they actually get more control. So I'm not exactly sure because I haven't studied that particular issue very carefully yet, but the new health care bill will certainly relieve some religious freedom issues, because President Obama put through a, a health care bill that was offensive to many Christian people. In other words, there were provisions in the bill that they could not conscientiously support. And that was serious enough, but that wasn't the end of the assault on religious freedom. 
you have to start in areas that, that are easy to work with, and then eventually, as time goes on, you can, you can add more restrictions on religious freedom. <clears throat> so the second thing was is the assault on religious freedom through the same-sex marriage issue. Same-sex marriage is a big issue in America as it is here in Europe and in Scandinavia. And it's un unfortunate, but the fact is that many Christian people who have Christian businesses or are, are businesses that are run by Christians run in the community or running in the community have run into legal problems because of their refusal to comply with the law regarding same-sex marriage. For instance, photographers who are requested to take pictures of same-sex marriages or cake makers who are contracted to make cakes for same-sex weddings um, they refuse to do this, they come under a lawsuit. It, in other words, they'll either comply with the law or have to go out of business. That is offensive to many, many Christian people. And Donald Trump is determined to overthrow some of those things because his evangelical base very strongly insists on this. Anyway, um, so those things are just happening right now, even as we are sitting here today. The new executive order on religious freedom was issued just yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to really look at it yet, but no doubt it gives people the freedom to live according to their conscience. The liberal media says that they're getting freedom to discriminate. You know, they try to paint this as if this is they're victimizing the, the, the homosexuals. So, the assault on religious freedom has matured over the last five or six years, the second term of President Obama. And now, because of the strong evangelical vote that put Donald Trump in power, means that now we are looking at a confrontation against the the progress that has been made in terms of undermining religious freedom. So that's, that's good in a way, because in a way the angels, as it were, are holding back the winds of strife. You know, sometimes you can see this. You know, they, they let the winds go a little bit, or they hold them back, depending on the level of, of uh, readiness of God's people for these things. But nobody can do anything against God or His truth unless they get permission from heaven. And I think that's very important. God is in control of all of this. So some of the things that Donald Trump does are actually good because they hold back the winds of strife. Other things that he does are not so good because he is, he is strengthening the power of the evangelicals. Do you think they're going to want to let go of that power once they get it? Of course not. They'll keep it, and they'll continue to exercise it well and truly after Donald Trump is long gone. So the Western constitutions have been gutted, and I'm not just talking about the United States Constitution. I'm talking about the British Constitution, uh, many of the European Western constitutions have lost many of their rights and privileges, all in the name of fighting terrorism and extremism. Um, and I should perhaps mention that extremism is a label that is used to vilify anyone the government wants to vilify, or anyone that a social group wants to vilify. They call them extremists. And there's a very interesting statement in Fundamentals of Education, page 289, Fundamentals of Education, page 289, which says, when we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, whirlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Now, how about that? You will be considered an extremist. Are you ready for that? That's hard for us here in Denmark, isn't it? We don't like to be accused of being extremists. 
We don't like to be compared with, with Muslim extremists, you know, or other extremists. That's painful. Uh, you know, if you're considered to be an extremist, you, you, you're going to want to distance yourself from that, right? But that's exactly how they are going to paint you. If you don't go along with the New World Order and the New World Order religion, if you rise to the standard that God has for you, you'll be preparing to enter heaven. But at the same time, you'll also be going through hell here on this earth because people will accuse you of being an extremist and that will isolate you, that will marginalize you from the rest of society. And most of us have a very hard time with that idea. We don't want to be marginalized. We don't want to be isolated. We don't want to be kept from doing our lives in the normal way. We would rather have, have the collaboration and uh, harmonization with all of society. So that's the second point, destruction of Western constitutions. And I've been mentioning the homosexual movement. That has also matured. It's a prophetic development that has matured in our times. You read about that in Genesis chapter 19. And I think it's interesting that um, some places have begun to put persecutory pressure on those who proclaim what the Bible says. There were two preachers in London, street preachers, in London recently who were arrested and taken to court because they quoted the King James Bible. And the court was saying, yeah, but uh, that was for another era. Today, even in our context today, even the King James Bible can be considered to be extremist or, or um, offensive. I think the word was offensive. Um, to the lifestyles of some people. Well, my friends, the Bible is all about lifestyle, isn't it? The Bible gives us guidance on how to live. And the Bible tells us what's right and what's wrong. You see, this, in this day and age, most people don't want to know any, anything about what's right and what's wrong. Whatever's right is what they think is right. And whatever they do is what they think is right. So they think they're right even if the Bible condemns what they do. I think it's interesting that we're living in such times. Genesis chapter 19 explains to us that the homosexual movement will be aggressive and it will be adversarial to anybody who loves truth and righteousness. That it will overthrow the law of God and it will overthrow the principles of the character of God. The, the homosexual movement is not supportive of Scripture. In spite of the fact that many liberal churches have now become gay-friendly, um, that's not going to change their hatred of the Scriptures. Churches, Certain liberal churches are modifying their, their views on what the Bible teaches concerning homosexuality. And some of us have even perhaps noticed that there have been ministers, even in conservative Protestant churches, such as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that have recently come out as either bisexual or gay. Of course, they lost their job or they resigned from their role because that's not where the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially stands. But what I'm saying is the pressure is starting to build against God's church with regard to homosexuality. And so some people who are, who are struggling with this issue come out of the closet, so to speak, and declare themselves bisexual or lesbian or gay. And uh, this, and of course, this is used by liberal people to promote this system of understanding within the conservative denomination. But the more liberal denominations have already adopted this principle. Um, the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church in America, the Methodist Church, 
uh, all of these churches have in many ways, in many respects, have become gay friendly. Um, and there are some nations where it's even more obvious than others. But this is a, a key issue, and it's a prophetic issue that is maturing and growing. The Bible says in Revelation 19 and verse 4, it says that, or rather Genesis 19, verse 4, uh, it says that before they lay down, this is, the, this is the lot and his guests that had come into the city. It says, before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, Compass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Why were they doing that? They were going to demand that Lot turn over those two visitors to them, those handsome men, so that they could do intimate things with them that God's word forbids. And these were angels of heaven in the form of men. Imagine the assault on heaven's purity by these men that surrounded the house of Lot. Well, let's think about this prophetically. As the nations of the world become, or at least the Western nations of the world, become more gay-friendly, this puts pressure on God's church. This exposes God's church to criticism and ridicule and abuse, just as it was in the days of Noah. But now we see that this same homosexual movement is surrounding the church on, on every front, politically, legally, socially, and with other religious groups and denominations. I think that's extremely useful because it helps us to understand that there is a maturing of this issue. And as you put that together with globalization, with the destruction of Western constitutions, and the homosexual movement, you put all three of those together, you have a very powerful end time scenario developing right before our eyes. You can add to that the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement is all about getting the churches to reduce their distinctive beliefs to just common, get rid of the distinctive ones and just emphasize the common beliefs that they all share. Well, there's not very many of those, by the way. <laughs> but there is a few, a few common beliefs. For instance, <clears throat> the Pope did a video some time ago in which, in the papacy, and they declared that they believe in love. And they had all these church leaders and religious leaders, icons of religiosity in these days, declaring that they believe in love. But love is a very broad and nebulous topic, isn't it? You know, it's, it's one of those things that sounds good, but really doesn't mean anything at all. And to the Catholic Church, the ecumenical movement, the, by the way, the Catholic Church started the ecumenical movement in the 1960s after Vatican Council II, or the Second Vatican Council. But the ecumenical movement has now matured. Pope Francis has been very, very aggressive in regard to the maturing of the ecumenical movement. He is trying to bring all churches into line with the papacy. He's trying to get all churches to de-emphasize their doctrines, their distinctive doctrines, so that they all just can unite around key doctrines that everybody can agree on. For instance, he told the Patriarch of Russia at Moscow, or Moscow and all of Russia, I guess is how it's called, the Orthodox Patriarch Kirill of the Orthodox Church in Russia. Now, there are five patriarchates in the Orthodox Church. Russia is only one of them. It was the only one that has not had ecumenical engagement with, 
the Vatican. The Russian Orthodox Church was offended by the Catholic Church some time ago during the, after the uh, collapse of communism in 1989 because many Catholics tried to convert Orthodox people in Russia to Catholicism, and that was very offensive to the Orthodox Church. So there wasn't very much ecumenical engagement, but Pope Francis was determined to do what he could to get the ecumenical movement together with the Russian Orthodox. And so he begged Kirill to have a meeting with him. He said, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And whenever you want me to go, you just tell me and I will come. Patriarch Kirill didn't want to do the meeting in Europe or at the Vatican because there's too many tensions, too much issues going on there for whatever reason. He had official business in Cuba. So he said, all right, I'll meet you in Cuba. I don't know whether he thought the Pope would actually get on the plane and come all the way to Cuba, but he did. You may remember they had a three-hour meeting, three-and-a-half-hour meeting, and they published a joint statement. And in that joint statement, they said they have agreed not to proselytize each other's members. What does that mean? That means to try to convert them from one church to the other. They've agreed not to do that. Now, of course, that's in the advantage of the papacy because ultimately the ecumenical movement is leading all the churches back under Rome's authority. So Rome's going to get all the Orthodox eventually. It doesn't need, they don't need to um, uh, proselytize in the traditional sense of proselytization, but the ecumenical movement is essentially proselytizing. So as the churches unite together, they come more and more in line with Rome. And this process is going on in every church. Pope Francis got on the plane, went to Cuba, had a three-and-a-half-hour meeting, got on the plane and went back again to the, to the Vatican. That hardly ever happens. Usually when the Pope goes on a trip, he's doing meetings for several days in several places, and it's on and on and on. He's got a lot happening. He's a busy man. But this meeting in Cuba was just for three and a half hours. He came all the way across the Atlantic and all the way back. Then you remember Tony Palmer bringing the Pentecostals to the Vatican for a ecumenical meeting with the Pope. They had dinner, three-hour dinner. You know, President Obama gets 45 minutes. Angela Merkel gets 40 minutes when she goes. And these are the top leaders of the world. Everyone else gets 15, 20 minutes. That's it. That's all you get with a pope. But not the evangelicals and not the patriarch, Kirill. They got three hours plus. And those evangelicals were there having a luncheon meeting as well, high-fiving the pope and doing all sorts of things, interesting things. The ecumenical movement is maturing and it is isolating anybody who doesn't go along with it. In other words, even the, even the small churches, and for instance, the Waldensian church, they've been involved now with the ecumenical movement too. Pope Francis actually crossed the threshold of a Waldensian temple in Turin something no pope had ever done in the history of the world, to talk to the Waldensians about ecumenism. And while he was there in Turin, he begged them to forgive him and forgive the Catholic Church for the brutal persecution that they conducted. That was his word, brutal persecution, that they had conducted against the Waldensians. And the Waldensians gave him forgiveness. So in other words, even the Waldensian church is now ecumenically engaged. Who's left? Who is left that opposes Rome's march towards religious domination? 
Europe is is all about restructuring, or I should say, re uh, or resurrecting. That's the word. The, it, Europe is all about resurrecting the Holy Roman Empire. The European Union is designed to hand the European nations back to the control of Rome to restore the Holy Roman Empire. That's what it's about. Most people don't see that. Most people aren't happy with the implications, or at least many people aren't happy with the implications of the European Union. That's why you have these right-wing movements in France and Austria and the Netherlands and Germany and even the Brexit itself. So the European Union is under assault. It might even collapse. After all, the Bible says that they shall not cleave one to another. The only way you're going to get the nations to unite together, as they have been doing, is to force it on them quietly, carefully, and over time. That's how it's happening. And ultimately, um, whether it survives or whether it collapses, uh, it will ultimately fulfill Bible prophecy. Because the papacy is going to influence all of Europe, ultimately. That's the trajectory of Bible prophecy. So those prophetic movements have all made a huge impact. And when these, now think about this, when these have all matured, they've all come to this point of, of, of maturity in our generation, all of a sudden, now we have an assault on cash. You know what I mean by an assault on cash? How many of you are using predominantly digital transactions now instead of cash transactions? Yeah, a number of you. And as cash becomes less and less used in society, there will be more and more push towards a digital economy. And when you have a digital economy, you can control the people and you can prevent them from buying and selling much easier if they don't comply with the new world order religion. That's the bottom line. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk more on the war on cash. I'm going to address the issue of <coughs> the assault on on cash in society and the move towards a cashless or a less cash society, you know, it's, it's an interim step. But ultimately, the goal, of course, is to have no cash. So now, now we're looking at a fifth development in a cashless move towards a society that would, that would eliminate cash altogether. And then as you add all those together, now we have Donald Trump, who is pushing the frontiers of what he calls religious freedom. But those evangelicals are interested in more than just their religious freedom. They want to remove yours. They want to prevent you from worshiping on God's holy Sabbath day. Many of them don't even realize it, but that's the ultimate goal and destination of the evangelical thrust in America to overcome the secular world. In other words, secularism, which Obama and Hillary uh, represented, secularism has to be overthrown in the minds of these evangelicals. And in order to overthrow secularism, which they view as opposed to God and opposed to the Bible, what do they have to do? Ultimately, they're going to have to impose a Sunday law. But we haven't had enough really serious disasters, natural disasters, that can explain or, can, or will naturally be explained as acts of God, as punishment on America or other nations for their moral collapse. You see, the nations of the West are collapsing morally. That's just the way it is. And as these nations 
become more and more immoral, God will allow Satan to bring in natural disasters. And he will then use them to claim that God is displeased with the moral collapse of these Western nations and these Western societies. Consequently, there will be a strong push then for the Sunday Law. We don't actually have that yet. We have little movements and developments that are taking place. But I expect that the next great prophetic development, I could be wrong, but the next great prophetic development is going to be the push to create a, a nation that goes back to God. But we have to wait until God allows Satan to bring in huge natural disasters that will make a huge impact on people and they'll begin to realize or begin to think that God is in fact punishing the nation it may not be for a while I don't know it may be very soon it all remains to be seen so the collusion of these developments in our day is very significant and I believe that as we consider these things, we need to also consider how we live. Because being as we are waiting for the second coming of the Lord, there's no better time and no more important time than to address anything in your life or anything in my life that is not in harmony with the Bible. And anything in our lives that's not in harmony with the lifestyle of the Bible. And lifestyle is where character is manifested, isn't it? Character is manifested in your lifestyle and mine. So when we live in our own way, rather than in the way of the Bible, we are actually turning our backs on God. And how can God then pour out His Holy Spirit and latter rain power so that His character, His glory, shall be seen on you and on me, unless we are in harmony with the Scripture? So my appeal today is that you and I, each one of us, surrender our life to Christ, align ourselves with the last generation lifestyle, and bring our lives into harmony with God's will. So may God bless you. Thank you for being here with me today. And thank you for listening to this message. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for Christ. Thank you so much for the prophecies of the Bible that reveal to us the coming of the Lord and that it is near. And Lord, we pray that we will not miss the important significance of the things that the Bible has predicted that are taking place all around us at this very time in history and in our lives. Lord, we pray that you will help us, give us the victory, Give us power over the enemy that we may live in harmony with your will and with your law. In Jesus' name.